Welcome to the 34th episode of the Decentralized Opportunity Podcast. I'm your host, Tanner Lytle, here with your other host, Wyatt Carson. Weird episode today, Tanner. An exciting episode, though. We're turning a new leaf. New leaf. New. Le yeah, that's how that saying goes. That's new leaf. Yeah, whatever. Uh, no, absolutely. We're trying something a little different here, and not intentionally. Um, so little background before we introduce our, our guest. <clears throat> um, Tanner, myself, lots of our friends um, have a Discord channel. And this Discord channel is like four years old. It's pretty impressive. And it's just a group of friends. We've known each other for like 20 years. And we chat every single day. And it's it's been a really healthy environment for all of us. It's a very tight-knit group of friends. We care for each other. We take care of each other. And we take on each other. Uh, it's just, just like a group of friends do, but as discord groups grow, you get like sub channels and so on and so forth. And we have a business professional channel where we can talk about work things, whether we're complaining or sharing something new and exciting or just new concepts, things we're finding about business. And uh, I think they created the channel Tanner cause you and I were annoying everyone, but, uh, <laughs> so they made us our own channel to talk about work and business stuff. And we decided to leave that and start a podcast. No, but anyway, so Tanner share the video. Don't share the video yet. We're, we're, we'll share that and, and we'll, we'll talk about it here in a second, but explain the video that you posted that created a kind of a whirlwind of activity in the sub channel of our discord. Yeah. Well, first let's introduce our guest. No, I'm just kidding. I love our guest. Our guest is my brother, Ryan Walkinshaw. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Thank you guys for having me. I'm excited of to be course, here. Of course, man. So the video in question is just the TikTok I saw on Twitter. And the little headline of the Twitter article said, this video was so depressing that I started tearing up watching it. And it's just, the video itself on TikTok is called Life After College as a 28-Year-Old with a Normal Job. And this was my normal thing I do on Discord where I just throw random links and memes and things and disappear for a little while because I have to get back to work or do family things or whatever. And after coming back to the Discord after quite a few hours, there was just walls of text of discussion that happened. So there is something about this video that kind of strikes a chord. I thought it would be really interesting to discuss it in more detail because what at first seems kind of like a little throwaway account after digging into both our discussions as well as looking at Twitter comments or why it even sent an N NBC article or something today that was talking about this. So there is something deeper that that is sparking this innocuous, know, innocuous video that doesn't really mean anything itself, but what does it signify and what people are getting out of it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, we brought Ryan on, uh, not because he's my brother. Uh, that's a perk of the, of the, that goes with it, but no, because Ryan really kicked off the discussion and we'll talk Ryan. We, we will certainly ask for your, your, your opinion on the video here shortly, but if I can sum up the video in your perspective from your comment, and please correct me, it was basically you're like, I don't get it. It doesn't look depressed to me. That looks like pretty sweet life. Super paraphrased right there, of course, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I had the opposite reaction. I was the one that like, well, man, that bummed me out, right? So Tanner, he's like messaging me the other day and he's like, yo, what do we brought your brother on the podcast immediately? I was like, bad idea. Nothing personal, Ryan. Um, <laughs> And I was like, what? Uh, and he's like, yeah, that, that, that post, that video, like the conversation we had in the discord, it was a mile long and it was really good. And, uh, so, you know what, after thinking about it, uh, Tanner, you're absolutely right. Um, this, this video has gone viral and, um, I think it's exactly what you said that there's a duality to the video. Do you remember the, is the dress blue or gold thing? Um, I think mm -hmm. this is the new, is this depressing or not? <laughs> <laughs> um, but what we're going to do is we're going to play the video on here. If you are listening to this podcast on a pod, you know, audio only Spotify, Apple, whatever, um, we will describe the video. And of course we'll link it in the show notes, but, um, for our YouTube viewers, we're going to show the video. It's like a minute and a half long. It's not horrible. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to discuss our, our viewpoints from it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, before we do that, Ryan, you want to introduce yourself, kind of describe who you are, your background to give some context to the audience as well? Yeah. So, um, you know, 34, so still relatively youngish, right? You know, um, I, I, I do work in a um, call center office environment um, in a managerial role. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of kind of the video itself that kind of, you know, struck home with me. I was like, oh, okay. You know, I related a lot to the video. So it's that, you know, I think that that was the important part of having that, that background is, you know, it's, it's a very similar to, you know, my life kind of thing or, or current situation. So yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's me and why I'm All here. Right. All right. Perfect. And when Wyatt said that it went viral, just looking at the Twitter post alone has 92.4 million views <laughs> oh, on wow. the Twitter post that I sent with looks uh, 45,000 quotes, 7,600 retweets, and close to 100,000 likes going on to it. So wow, within one day, it definitely has taken the internet by storm. But, <laughs> so let's watch it here. All right, you guys can see that? Yeah. Cool. All right, so, so um, uh, real quick, I'm not gonna describe the entire video, it's a it's a single guy. Looks like he's maybe late twenties, early thirties, in an apartment of some sort, getting ready for work. All right, I'm, I'm I'll, I'll narrate less. I promise. Driving to work at the elevator, working away on his laptop. Takes lunch. He goes home to his dog, cute dog. Plays with him, takes him for a walk. Gives gives a little doggy a snack, and then he sits down, eats some leftovers. Drives back home to work, finishes the day out. He goes to the gym after work, does a little working out. Poor form with his lateral raises. He goes home, drinks a protein shake, trains his dog a little bit, plays with him a bit more. Takes a shower, cleans up after the gym. Grabs a beer. Some frozen dinner. Sits down, eats dinner, watches Hulu. End of video. And then I think that the caption at the end says something about and then get ready to do it all again tomorrow, right? So that's the that's the video that has sparked so much controversy or I really feel it is a Rorschach test for where you are in your life and what you think life should be, I guess, after college or as you grow up, right? So to start off Wyatt, why don't you give your reaction first when you saw that? Give me your thought process going through it. Yeah, so my first watch of the video, um, you know, it's the kind of the sad melodic music. Um, and then, like I said, the last caption is, and then I get ready to do it all over tomorrow <clears throat> um, or something along those lines. My first reaction was this dude's caught in kind of a monotony cycle. He does this every day. He goes to, he gets up, he goes to work, comes home, plays with his dog, eat some leftovers, go back to work, get off work, go to the gym, go home, eat, eat a frozen dinner and a beer, um, watch Hulu and go to bed. Uh, and then he just repeats that cycle. So the, my initial reaction was, yeah, he's, he's caught in this, in this cycle and he's kind of feeling bummed out about it. The impression I got. Uh, he's sad about it and he's just, you know, kind of slogging his way through life, going through the circle every single day. Um, and, and I think that in our discord, the comment I made was something along the lines of, yeah, that's depressing or something along those lines. And then Ryan came in with a wall of text, just just (laughs) threw it out there. Um, and, and Ryan explain, explain your perspective on that. So. I, I, you know, had time to think about this, you know, uh, kind of thing, because it's I, I never like doing the wall of text in Discord, 
on a, on a, a subject that I'm passionate about, just because like, that's all I focus on at that moment kind of thing. So like, if I see something, I was like, oh, whatever. I don't know why this caught my eye. Um, it, it was my biggest issue with, with the, the more specifically the Twitter was how one person was framing somebody else's life. Right. Um, it, it's, it's one person taking a video that's, that's not theirs, posting it to Twitter and being like, Hey, they, they're sad, they're depressed, this, their life sucks. And that, that's where my biggest issue was with it is, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, kind of gauge somebody else's life when you're not living the life. Right. It, it's, you know, kind of why it mentioned earlier, like, yeah, you know, I think it, you know, pretty, pretty chill life, right. You know, go to work, play with your dog, come home, chill, you know, go to the gym. And we have, you know, one very, um, you know, small portion of the guy's life. It's, it's, you know, a minute or so video. And so I think that's where my biggest issue was, is, is you're seeing such a small portion of the guy's video. So I did a deep dive. This is how passionate I got about it. I did a deep dive into the dude's TikTok. I went to his Instagram, like I kind of just dived into it. And it, it was, you know, if you look at the beginning of the video as he's putting his backpack on there, you know, it looks like on his left hand, he has a wedding ring, you know, on his Instagram, he was golfing with, with friends, you know, he also had some, some guy time. I think they went to Chili's or something like that on Instagram. Um, you know, it just, he, there, there's so much more to that guy's life than just that one moment that somebody called depressing. And I think that's really where it kind of struck a chord because I'm very much the same way, right? I go to work, come home, I work from home. So it's a little short travel going from work to home, but it's also, you know, I do occasionally go out and, and, and do things, but my whole life doesn't just necessarily evolve around what other people would consider fun of like going and partying all the time or, you know, going out um, to paintball events, you know, kind of thing, you know, stuff like that. So it's, it, it's just was such a unique, you know, um, reaction that I had of somebody else gauging somebody's life without any sort of context around it at all. So before we dive into that, Tanner, why did you post that video? Why, what did you find interesting about it that made you think, Hey, that said group of friends would find this interesting. <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, I sent a meme image of life of a workplace and it was just a gray cubicle and it's like the perfect workspace workspace nothing can ever get better and it's it was just this gray i don't even know how to describe it it was just this gray box that this person lived in that was really just nothing personal it was just uniform cookie cutter and to me just felt very depressing and this video was all along the same lines of that meme there's nothing wrong with working in those cubicles uh, i've done that in the past myself there's nothing wrong with this guy's day anything but what to me what it kind of symbolizes is something that was greater and ryan i really love that you went deep dive <laughs> into this because I'm I'm happy that this guy is most likely very, very happy, mm -hmm. but how this video is um, put together and what it shows and ultimately what it represents and what it symbolizes, I think is what is catching a chord with people. And it's what's not shown is really what is, I don't know, just, just hurting some and doesn't seem that bad to others. So I think that's where we can kind of deep dive into it too, because it reminds me a lot of the movie Fight Club and the life that the narrator lived before, where it was just this spree of the same every single day. You never really saw the friendships, the the life, the if he's married, the wife through those things. You just see the, the basic cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. And I would love to kind of dive into a little bit what each of those pieces represent, because <laughs> there's a lot I kind of nerded out on this a little bit too, not diving into his past, but just seeing what like each scene kind of means to me, if that kind of makes sense. And I would love to get your guys' take on that as well. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Let's dissect the video before we dissect each other. <laughs> <laughs> So the first scene is him just saying specifically life after college as a 28 year old with a normal job. And what strikes this to me is when we're all kids, 
we all wanted to be astronauts and artists and police officers or whatever we wanted to be when we grew up. And none of us really aspired to just work in a normal nine to five cubicle. And there's something about life after college, because once you're going in, into college, you have so much aspirations, dreams and things like that. And to me, this type of job is the lie that college tells you and, <laughs> and that we do actually end up with. So that's the first piece I kind of want to hit on. It's the it's the khakis, it's the polo, the business casual dress, getting ready for a work that ultimately may or may not be fulfilling. Thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, th I think it's, um, you know, kind of touch base. Yeah, I wanted to be a psychologist, right? You know, um, when we were doing our senior like aptitude tests or whatever, whatever they were called, right? Um, so, I mean, this life certainly wasn't what, I initially wanted. I, I do think it's something where, you know, although life may not necessarily go kind of the direction that you wanted to, I, I, th I do think that people don't, not everybody settles. I do think people settle. Don't get me wrong. I, I 100% do feel people settle. But like for me, for example, it wasn't, it wasn't a role that, that I feel I settled into. It was, you know, uh, my first job was working in a call center on the phones, right? And, and very quickly, you know, I knew leadership and managerial was the direction that I wanted to go, right? So that whole dream of being a psychologist, you know, slowly kind of faded in the background as, as the years went by. But yeah, you know, I definitely feel, you know, that people do settle and, and sometimes they do feel stuck in, in their roles for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I mean, as Tanner said, everyone wants to be an astronaut or a firefighter. You know, I grew up wanting to be Magnum PI, but uh, <laughs> no, I Tanner, I didn't psychoanalyze the video as much. I think I just took it all in and as an atmospheric kind of sense. Once again, I think that video would have been very different if it had different music, but I'm not here to analyze videography. Um, yeah, he, he, even the way he described it is I'm a typical 28 year old in a typical job. He already kind of sets the precedent that it's boring. Um, and I think, you know, whether this dude goes off and, you know, has parties with, you know, people on yachts and golfs and is married or is irrelevant, uh, in my opinion, what he was trying to portray in the video was well said, Tanner, it's, it's, it's cyclical, it's boring, it's not what he expected out of life, you know, maybe it's not even what he expected while he was in college, but a large population of us end up in, you know, those cliche jobs wearing khaki sitting in a cubicle and we've all sat in cubicles and we've all just typed away on a computer for eight hours a day. And I think I was able to relate immediately with him. Uh, once again, the assumed vibe of being bored, I related. I was like, man, you know, this is certainly not the astronaut job I planned on having. I don't remember what I wanted to be when I was a kid, but it wasn't a consultant. Um, so Ryan, that's, I think you analyzed it really well. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not, I, I won't go into analyzing your response yet. Sorry, just the video. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Tanner. <clears throat> no, you're good. And it may not have been this guy's intention for any of this, but I think the reason it's going so viral is because of some of more of these deeper layers, some of these subconscious things that are triggering to us all. And in the comments, there was so many people that said like, this life looks perfectly fine, or this life looks great, or I would love to have what this guy has. And then there was other ones who, other people who just were immediately struck. And I think that that's the balance of where you are in your life and what you're looking for, or maybe also what your regrets are. Because again, going back to when you're younger and you have dreams of certain things, and we're a podcast about entrepreneurship and business and technology and all these cool things that you can do and enable you to do today. And someone who is that way probably has a different reaction than those who are not entrepreneurial and want to work a typical nine, nine to five who can turn off after they punch out compared to someone who's always mulling and ruminating about it all. So to me, again, it's a little bit of a Rorschach test or a litmus test on what you value, but also 
what you're scared of. And to me that it's a little bit, even just the first scene with the title is a little bit what you're scared. I'm scared of at least in some bit, bits and pieces. So moving on, the next thing was him driving in his car and it says, um, what is it here? Heading to my nine to five employee benefits. So I know this is something that's very true to Wyatt, the hate of the commute and the love of remote work. Mm -hmm. So why don't you jump into that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, since, since before COVID, I have been a huge advocate of companies just getting along with the work from home scene because, uh, you know, uh, for example, Ryan, when I lived in Denver and I worked uh, up at the casinos in, in Blackhawk, Colorado, it was an hour and like 10 minutes, hour and 15 minutes and if there was weather, which there always was in the mountains of Colorado, hour and a half to work one way, which meant I had a three hour commute most of the time. Um, so I would leave really early. I would, it was a very busy job. Don't get me wrong. It was a great job, but it was a very busy job. So I worked my, you know, usually a little over and then I had an hour and a half, you know, commute back home. Um, and don't get me wrong, like part of that commute, I really loved. I loved driving in the mountains. Sometimes I would be late for work because there were mountain goats in my way. Like who does that? It was fun. But at that time when I was working nine, 10 hours a day, plus three hours of commute, my wife and two children were at home by themselves. And my youngest child was a baby. <clears throat> I, I missed so much. I missed every single New Year's Eve. I missed several other important holidays. Um, and, and that neither here nor there it's focusing just on the commute thing three hours a day you know times five days is 15 hours per week which is 60 hours per month which is whatever that times 12 is it's too late in the evening for me to do that kind of math sorry guys um <clears throat> it adds up and um i ended up missing a lot of things and i ended up resenting it i loved my beautiful drive but at the end of the day i knew i was hurting my family. And then, you know, COVID happened and I'm not saying I'm thankful for COVID. That's not at all what I'm saying. Horrible, tragic thing. But what it did is wake up America to remote work. And I will fist fight a person before they try and make me go into an office ever again. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I work from home and I love it and I thrive off of it and I'm productive in it. And don't get me wrong, it's not for everyone, but, um, Seeing that guy in the car driving to work, you know, going to my nine to five, don't worry, it's got benefits. It just kind of reiterated the I'm bored. This is not the life I expected for myself. What's your thoughts, Ryan? Yeah, you know, um, kind of piggyback off what Wyatt was saying about the remote work. They're like, I hated it at first. So we we made a very quick move um, once COVID hit you know, a couple weeks after, you know, it became large news, we sent everybody home, right? Um, and we've been working from home ever since. Um, I hated it. I really, I really did hate working from home. I'm, I'm very much a people person. And I love interacting with with people just in person. Um, so the uh, to be completely honest, the first year and a half, maybe, maybe two years, I, I was depressed working from home. Like I, I hated it. It's just, you know, I go to go to my desk, you know, go to the living room after work or on lunch and, you know, stuff like that. It, it really, you know, in the last year or so, I started getting used to it and I started liking it. Um, as far as the benefit, yeah, absolutely. I, I totally feel there's there's a benefit to, you know, working from home. You're, you're saving money on gas. You're saving money on, on you know, potential car repairs or tire repairs. You know, there, there is, you know, a financial sense that employees are saving working from home. So, yes, the commute definitely is um, – it sucks, you know, especially if you have a three hour commute. One thing that I loved commuting to and from work though, was the, in the afternoon, it was the decompress, right? You know, long day, you know, interacting with people, you know, your, your social batteries, you know, ran out for the day kind of thing. So, you know, you're listening to music or radio or um, podcasts or audiobooks, whatever that, you know, I loved having that chance to decompress and I just don't think I get that same benefit now, you know, working from home and in the mornings, you know, it was a chance to kind of amp myself up for the day, you know, listening to heavy metal and, you know, kind of getting my, my energy up, you know, on the way to work and, um, 
because I would work very early, you know, six, seven o'clock in the morning. So I'd have to, you know, of course, get up earlier and kind of thing. So yeah, I, you know, I do, there's always benefits to either side, right? It's just depends on, on the preference. Now I wouldn't want to go into the office every single day. I would want to go in, you know, once in a while, like next week, I'm going into the office. It's, it's a one day event, you know, still working from home kind of thing. So I, I definitely think there's benefits. I think it's just, you know, on, on preferences, preferences and, and kind of what, what you feel is, is best for you at that point. Mm -hmm. So the next thing going into it is I already touched base on it, but the, the cubicle, the gray cubicle. And I think that's probably, again, what struck me to sending it to the group was kind of the play off of the meme before of just the faceless corporate office, corporate life, no real value off of it. Did you guys get kind of that same feel as he dusted off his laptop and come into it? Or what were your thoughts? Mm -hmm. I think I think that's something pretty common we're seeing in today's workforce <clears throat> with the younger generation. Um, they want to see value in their work. Right. Um, and, and I think a lot of people are waking up to the concept that, holy crap, like, did I do anything good today? Did I do anything productive today? I mean, <clears throat> I can spend eight hours in a spreadsheet making some beautiful graphs or whatever, but at the end of the day, if I sat down and be like, what did I do that made a difference today? Sometimes it's hard to answer that question. And I think the younger generation, the gr generation coming into the workforce right now are starting to see that a lot of these typical jobs, these office jobs, these cubicle jobs, um, they're, they're not fulfilling them in the way they expected work to fulfill them. Yeah. You know, one, one of my, you know, major conversations that we always have in our leadership group is, you know, the, that instant gratification, you know, it's, it's people, especially the younger generation want to come into the, to the workforce and be like, Hey, I've been here for six months. I want this, this, and this, a lot of it's reasonable, totally understand it. Right. You know, it's, it's, generational, you know, experiences, you know, you could have somebody who's in their eighties who would have loved to have that desk. And, and you like, you know what, you need to put in the years to, you know, get a raise or to get a company car or whatever the case is. And, you know, there's, I, I honestly feel that millennials, are, you know, ourselves between the three of us, I feel the majority of that group are split on, on that. You know, I, personally want to put in the work and put in the time and, and know that I've made a difference in, in my work. And I think there's some other, you know, millennials that, you know, aren't quite the instant gratification, um, but, but definitely want to feel that immediate value that they're, they're putting into the workforce and that, you know, what they do, you know, matters immediately. You know, it's, it's not something where, you know, they want to wait, you know, for their annual performance eval or, you know, the end of the week to kind of know how well they, they did. They want to know right then in that moment. I just want to caution, we're going into dangerous territory with this conversation. I think I think we're talking about two different things. Um, there's the very okay boomerish viewpoint of today's generation just doesn't want to work for it. And they don't want to just stay at the same company for 45 years. Well, no shit. You know, <laughs> that's not the way the world works anymore. I'm not talking about instant gratification. I'm talking about this new generation, this new workforce generation. I don't care about teenagers. I'm talking the people getting out of college, whatever. Um, <clears throat> it's not a, I'm not talking about their instant gratification or anything like that. I'm talking about, they want to know that they are spending 40 hours a week on something good, something beneficial that they, they change something other than their, their company's bottom line. That's more what I'm referring to. More mission based. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. They want to see that they're putting something out into the world that is of value. Sure. And and I think it I think that specifically is is hard unless you're you're very much in a you know specialized field. You know, I, I think it's easier for somebody to do that if they're in a medical field, right? You know, they're they they know they're helping people, they know they're making people better, you know, they're making lives easier. I, I think it's I think it's harder, especially with people getting into the workforce and, and, you know, maybe an office job is the only job that's, you know, available to them. I think it's, it's harder for, you know, not only the company to, to express that here's how you're making a difference, but also for somebody to feel that as well, just because, you know, it's, it's such a, it's such a unique thing that you don't necessarily impact people directly. Like 
you know, going back to that example of the medical field, you know, you're, you're making an impact in the medical field. So I, I think it's, I think it's harder and I, and I don't think there, you know, yes, there's a lot of companies that we can blame for just that bottom line, come in, do your work, go home kind of thing. But I, I do feel like there's a lot of companies out there that are trying to find how we can show that value and how we can, you know, uh, you know, get people excited to come in and make a difference in somebody's, you know, life and kind of thing. So I think it's, I think the tide's turning for sure. Um, but it, it's, it's still very much in a bottom line driven environment. Absolutely. And, 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 and I don't disagree with what you said at all, Ryan. I think <clears throat> companies are realizing that they have to figure out how to portray the message of what they're actually doing, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the value that company brings to the world. And if they can figure out what value they bring, then they can figure out, they can work backwards and figure out what the employee brings. And I think those companies that can't figure out how to articulate the value they bring to the world are going to continue to have this problem of thinking, well, no one wants to work anymore. And why won't they yeah. work for me for 45 years in a cubicle go doing the same mind numbing job? It's because they didn't figure out how to articulate the value that they bring and thus the value that an employee in that company would bring. So no, I, I, I completely agree. Yeah, absolutely. I, lo I love where you guys took that. Um, to get back to the, the actual cubicle part of it, the one thing that strikes me is the space itself is not beautiful. Like there's something about working in a place that is either aesthetically pleasing or warming to be in, or just the difference between working indoors and working outdoors. Um, there is something going back to, again, a sense of beauty. There's beauty in nature. There's new scenes. There's outdoor. When you're in those gray cubicles, everything is the same every single day. There's no variation. There's no nothing. And that kind of goes back into this loop that Wyatt was talking about and why it terrifies me so much. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've, I've worked for companies where, you know, they they had a strict rule. You could have three personal items. Um and I hated it. I, I, I pushed it as much as I possibly could. Um, and I've had, I've had jobs where I've had stacks of Funko Pops and I've had pictures on the wall and I've had, they, they just didn't care because they wanted to allow the employees to, to make the space their own. And I think what's unique about that video is, is again, we don't know specifically what the company's policies are. You, could potentially have nothing on your walls. Um, or he, he found an empty cubicle just solely to make that video to hide proprietary information. But I think what, what's interesting about it is it's empty, right? You know, it's, it's a lot There's of some companies... papers on the wall. There, there is, is there? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I think, I think what's interesting is, you know, some people I I've, I've worked with a lot of, you know, agents and I've worked with a lot of, you know, different leaders who very much had empty spaces and they were okay with empty spaces. And I, I've had people who, um, you know, wanted to fill their, their desks with trinkets and, and family photos and stuff like that. So I think it's just such a, you know, personal preference yeah, within whatever potential company, what they allow. Yeah. I heard a story of the employer I'm at before they've been sold twice over, but the original owner, his wife, they built this beautiful office building out in Omaha. And I mean, it's really nice walls of glass, just really neat but the wife was obsessed with how it looked and you had to have the phone in the exact same place in every cubicle employees were not allowed to move the phone before you left your desk you had to have it the exact same way every single day that you couldn't have anything hanging on the walls or anything and first of all i'm left-handed so having the phone on the right sign is completely illogical for me but just that amount of oppression in how it, having to have it so meticulous and exacting is again, going back to what I feel just restrained and constrained and uneasy. I just get the feeling of corporate life that sure. I kind of got from this. Um, just to continue on. So he heads home for lunch, gets the love on his dog. I think that that part's super sweet. And that's, that's really kind of the saving grace. I feel like of this video is the relationship of him and his dog. Um, getting to go outside and play, give him a snack, eat some leftovers, and then the same face on the drive back to work. <laughs> and it's just kind of this blank stare. And again, I don't know how intentional and it'd be interesting to hear from the creator how what his thought process was creating it if it was this kind of bored intentional or if just thought didn't think anything of it. And he's like, oh, I just filmed my face. Um, but just going from like happiness with the dog 
to being, you know, with something you love to going back to the grind. Yeah. You know, I played devil's advocate on it. You know, it's, I, I don't know what face we're supposed to make when we're driving, but I, I imagine that's what a lot of our faces are look like when we're, when we're, you know, focusing on the road, you know, Hey, let's not crash into anybody kind of thing. Um, going back to the dog thing and going home for lunch. I love that. Right. You know, I, anybody that I work with, um, I'm very much a, a advocate for work life balance, step away from your desk, eat, eat your lunch away from your desk, go outside, touch some grass. Right. I think as the younger kids say these days, um, I, I very much love That's a different the, type of grass, Ryan. Oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things I, I love work life balance so much that, that I separate it. Like I, I have friends who I've worked with in the past and I I've set very strict boundaries with them. And I'm like, I'm not talking about work outside of work. Like, I don't care how small it is, how big it is. Like, we're, we're, we're outside. I don't care what we're doing. Um, but I'm not going to talk about work. And I, and I very much love the fact that he stepped away. He got to spend some time with his dog. You know, maybe he, you know, grabbed lunch or, you know, whatever, you know, on the way to, or, or, or back to work kind of thing. So I very much that, that was my favorite part of the video too, is, is the fact that he got a chance to step away. Mm -hmm. I love that insight. Tanner, I didn't pick up on the facial expressions. So, I mean, uh, props to you. I didn't even notice that, but there were those intermittent breaks of happiness doing what he enjoyed and then back to work. You know, uh, I didn't notice that. <clears throat> yeah. And so finishes out the day goes, hits the gym. I think that's a fantastic thing that everybody should do. Um, we don't need to get in on that part. Haircut every three weeks. That that's a little crazy to me. I'm a six week person and I keep my hair pretty short. Um, that cost can get up, but you do you. My hair grows insane, Tanner. I cut my hair every yeah. two weeks. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, gets home, cleans up, has his dinner, and pours the worst way to pour a beer possible. Um, yeah, what that's that, that garbage. <laughs> that, that's just trying to probably film and get first the off, dude. It's a Michelob Ultra. Chill out. You can drink it right. from a can, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and and then just kind of veg out and watch Hulu. So, Ryan, I'll let you kind of get into your bullet points from your thoughts, and then we'll kind of yeah. kind of hit on what we got from it all. You know, it's it, it's it's interesting because you guys have touched base or on like the facial expressions and I want to kind of go back to that, not just from driving back, but also when you got back to work kind of thing, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I love what I do and I, I love my job, but if you were to look at my face when kind of like why it was saying when I'm working on Excel spreadsheets or, um, working on, you know, performance for the team and how we can, you know, help everybody grow kind of thing. Like I, I I'm not, you know, the going to look, to be the happiest person in, in, in the world kind of thing. You know, it's, I'm, I'm focused, I'm, I'm focused on what I'm doing and, and, you know, maybe my tongue's sticking out as I'm trying to focus on, on work, like I'm trying to think. Um, but I think, I think it's interesting, you know, it's just such the, the, you know, thought process of, of one person compared to another, right. You know, one person sees that as, you know, oh, they just, they don't want to go back to work or they hate their job or, or um, they're, they're depressed or they're stuck, you know, another person, you know, sees that as a, oh, they're focused, they're working, they're, they're trying to um, get things done. And I, I've had, I've, I have people that I have worked with and that I currently work with, and we very much live the same lives. And we have two different outlooks, like uh, those people, you know, feel stuck. Other people, you know, in that same role feel like, yeah, they have a, you know, a great life. They, they go to the gym, they come home, you know, and they do it all over again the next day. Right. And, and I think it's just such an interesting dynamic that people think everybody that does that, you know, it, is stuck, but you can have two people in that same exact life and they, they themselves feel two different things. Right. So I, I think it's just such a unique, you know, mental health thing too, of, of how you process your day and how you process your stress and, you know, I, me, I've done a lot of therapy work <laughs> over the years, right? So I, I feel very comfortable in, in, you know, my ability to manage stress and, and you know, fight off depression and, and all of that. And, you know, some people are, are more stubborn. And so they're in the same situation that I'm in, but they don't know how to process all of it. And, and they don't know how to prevent themselves from feeling stuck and feeling depressed and, and all of that. 
What? I have I have a lot. Uh, <laughs> I've got to I've got to try and compartmentalize my thoughts. So let me let me, I'll start off by talking about myself. <clears throat> um, the more you get to know me, the more you might find out that I am secretly a hippie. Um, I man. I'm telling you, if I could live on a convent and garden all day, I would 100%. I'll, I'll wear tie dye and linen pants and get my Birkenstocks. I wear those every single day. Sometimes at work. Um, so I think I think I look at this video from an extreme because you know you've always heard the 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 question: If you won the lottery tomorrow, would you continue to work? Ryan, would you continue to work if you won the lottery? Not at the same role, no. I would work and do different, different like ventures and like um, all of that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't stay at my exact <clears throat> if job. If you became a multimillionaire tomorrow, you would go out and find something valuable, maybe start a charity, do those sort of things. Is, is am I interpreting that right? Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say it's it's not because I don't love my job. I think there's just much more that I'm I'm free to do now, right? You know, there the 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 restrictions of money, which, you know, everybody deals with is, is now released. So I, I think it allows me to kind of, like you said, to start charities or, um, you know, travel and, and visit family and, and, you know, not have to, I'm talking, work. yeah, as far as working, no, like I, I would just go out and do, you know, different things. Right. I, I wouldn't work anymore. So, so that's, that's, that's the point I, I I'm talking. Um, I wouldn't have a job if I didn't have to. Mm-hmm. I'm not that kind of person. This is where Tanner and I, we, we sometimes butt heads, but also make excellent co-hosts because Tanner is a workaholic sometimes. And Tanner gets down a path and he'll attack it relentlessly. Me. I'm like, nee, it's cool. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, if I didn't have to have a job, I wouldn't. Um, I also love my job. I love my company. My company is very great. Have been very great to me. Um, I am very fortunate for my career and I'm very good at my job, but if I didn't have to do it, I wouldn't do it. Um, and that's why I think I took this video from my, my extreme of, you know, I, I sit at sometimes, you know, at night I'll sit there, uh, zoning out, staring at a book or, or whatever kids are watching TV. And I'll be like, man, if I own like a few acres and I would make, I'd raise some chickens, I'd build a garden and then I'd maybe get into woodwork. Like that's, my idea of a great life. Yeah. And when I see this video, you know, whether it's this guy's real life or not is irrelevant. He brought up an excellent point and, and the reason we're talking about it, um, looking at that compared to what I fantasize about my life being they're polar opposites. And that's why yeah. I had my reaction of like, I'm that depresses me because that's the opposite of what I would love. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, there, there's, there's a million things I would rather do. Like I, I would want to own a, a classic car collection, right? You know, just, you know, learn how to work on cars, you know, kind of similar to the, how you've been doing recently. Why it, it's, there's so much I'd rather actually be doing, but you know, unfortunately we just don't have the luxury of, of not being able to work. Right. You know, exactly my point, which means yeah. you've settled. I've settled. Tanner settled. Sure. The working force of America has settled that's where my perspective of this video came in is he is early mid twenties and he just learned, Oh man, America isn't full of super ambitious workers. Like the world thinks no mm -hmm. America is full of 333, you know, million people who settled. And that's not a bad thing. This is how our life and society flows and works and, and, and capitalism and all that good stuff. Uh, you know, uh, but as exactly what we were talking about, how you can control your emotions and you've learned to, you know, recognize depression and work through it. And some people haven't. Mm -hmm. All that says to me is you've learned to adapt to that life. Sure. Right. That, that, and, and that's a settlement. Sorry, Tanner, we're totally cutting you out right now. No. Go ahead, man. I, my, my view on this piggybacks on exactly what you guys are saying. I, uh, I talked about Fight Club earlier and how that it's it's themes throughout its story and how it kind of feels, but also this kind of relates to the Matrix a little bit to me, and what it kind of reminds me of. And I'll go deep on this, and you guys can tell me what your thoughts are. So much of it makes me feel of like a kind of domesticated, pacified life that we are all kind of thrown into, and it is going from the 
because he lives in a nice house. He's got nice things. He has a great dog. It seems like he has a good job. He has insurance. He has everything that you think that you need. But it doesn't seem like a life that we're excited to live, right? It seems like a life that would be really hard to escape. And we've talked about in a prior episodes, I bring it up every once in a while, the concept of a region beta, the, the region beta paradox, where oftentimes for us to make changes, we have to do more, there has to be more drastic things than just small pains. So for, I guess the actual definition, let me, I had it pulled up here. Um, the region beta paradox is the phenomenon that people can sometimes recover more quickly from more distressing experiences than from less distressing ones. So this is a life, in my opinion, that is good, but not great, but it, because it's good, you'll never escape it. And that's what scares the crap out of me. It's the, you have everything that you need, but you're kind of unhappy. And again, going back to intentional or not, this is definitely a, a projection, a, a litmus test of whatever, of whatever you feel in your heart, but his, the, the dead eye is driving the, the gray work zone, the happiness when being with his dog, which to me is nature. <laughs> and all of these things disconnect us from who we are. And I think that is the other reason why so many people are finding it off-putting because it doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel natural. The other thing that I noticed with it too was he was eating processed food the whole time. It was leftovers from Jersey Mike's. It was a frozen pizza. It was a, you know, it was a processed beer. Nothing was natural. Nothing he made himself. Again, I'm sure he cooks. I'm sure he eats healthy things, but just it, the messaging and symbolism in this video just kind of show us everything that is potentially wrong with our modern society and how we think of life and our careers. And if we want something different. So that's kind of my deep philosophical take on, on reading it. What are your guys' thoughts? Boy, uh, boy, I'll tell you, man, if I ever create a simulation for people, like if I'm ever using humans as a battery kind of thing, I'm going to make their simulation happy. If this is a simulation, this is the worst simulation I wrote. <laughs> I'll tell you that, right? But yeah, I mean, it, it is, you know, a kind, of, kind of like, you know, what, what I said earlier on is you'd like, you know, we're, we're seeing such a small piece and that's the, and not focusing back on, you know, you're only seeing one small piece, but we're, we're seeing a piece and, and, and that piece, you know, just brings a lot of symbolism and, and what created this whole thing to, to go viral is, you know, very specific things, right? That the, the gray cubicle, the processed food, even though honestly, that flatbread looked delicious, but that's a different story, right? Um, you know, it, we're, we're seeing very much, you know, very, very small pieces and, and it could be intentional, right? It, it could also be things that, that we, we see are problems in the world. So automatically we pick up on them, you know, it's just natural human instinct, right? You see one blue car, you're going to see a bunch of blue cars kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's just such a unique video because of the debate that it sparked, because people are zoning in on very specific, but also very different things, too, um, just based off of their own life experiences. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And and I mean, exactly as Tanner said, is the, I think the reason this video went so viral is because every single person is projecting themselves into this video, yeah, right? Hundred um, percent. Everyone looks at this video and they don't see a poor sap who works in a cubicle. They see themselves, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Oh crap! I do the same thing." Um, so, if, for for reference, when Tanner and I were discussing original topics for this podcast, <clears throat> um, for this episode, before that video came out, and we kind of shifted, you know, took a hard right direction. Um, I was playing with the idea of entrepreneurship, not to become monetarily successful, rich, but to just like be cool and, 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 you know, give yourself the life you want, not yeah. just money based. Um, and this video plays into that theme, I think really well, um, what I've been kind of thinking about once again, if, if I could live on a convent in the woods in the mountains on a lake, like reading books all day, I'm golden. But, and another thing and Tanner and Tanner and I've hit on this, we had a podcast episode called, uh, hustle, hustle culture is toxic. Mm -hmm. One of my personal favorite episodes, uh, according to our stats, no one else thought so. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but there's, there's certain, I, I, 
have started to view entrepreneurship and business and the corporate world from the perspective of it's, it's, it's an ends to a mean, you know, uh, it's, 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 you, it's something you do to get somewhere. Um, the concept of that's what that guy's going to do every single day until he's 65 and a half years old and can start pulling his 401k. If you don't think that's depressing, I wish I had your outlook because, um, you know, I've, I've started to look at things. I have, I have five things I wrote down during this podcast and they're not mantras or anything like that. They're just kind of themes I've been thinking about and they fit with this video um, because they're kind of diametrically opposed. Um, for one, uh, there's nothing wrong with doing nothing for as long as you want. That's something Americans have a really hard time hearing. It's okay to not do anything, right? You don't have to be doing amazing things and starting the world's next Twitter or whatever, you know, um, similar to this, to this video, your paycheck has nothing to do with your worth. You know, that guy, um, working in his new cubicle, probably making, I don't know, 60 K to start, whatever he makes. I don't know. He's the same guy who also gets up at four o'clock in the morning and puts on a construction vest and drives to the work, you know, drives to, to hold a sign out for road construction during the summer. Uh, it's the same guy who goes out to, uh, his job at a theme park and checks tickets for children all day. It's about pattern and it's about monotony and it's about the grass is always greener. You know, mm. I'd say I would love to live on a convent, but I bet you if it happened, I'd probably be bored out of my damn mind. Right. You know, with grass is grass is greener is a, is a warning for all of us, especially in America where our, we grow up to be workers. That's, that's what Americans mm -hmm. are. Um, you know, we, we are raised from kindergarten to be ready for the workforce to live and sit in a cubicle. Right. Um, another big controversy, but I think you should be allowed to do things without having to monetize them. Right. Uh, going back to the entrepreneurship, the business building aspect of this podcast, um, just because you have a hobby or just because you're good at something, you know, doesn't mean you have to make money off of it. If it brings you personal happiness, like that guy and his dog, maybe he's like an excellent dog trainer, right? And this is, the, this is how deep I, I went into trying to psychoanalyze this video. Cause I think <laughs> I kept it very surface level in our discord channel between you two. Um, there's, it's a problem today, which leads me to really my last point. Um, and just this thought process, I'm sorry, this sounds jumbled guys, but it's okay to see through the scam of hustle culture or girl boss culture and choosing to prioritize whatever the heck you want to do, right? It, it, 100 years ago, well, maybe not 100 years ago, late 1800s, um, other than like city workers who worked in like factories and mines and stuff like that, like it was just agriculture. Like people just lived on their family farms and grew potatoes and stuff. Um, and the world changed and we have to adapt to that. But, uh, it's okay to want more out of your life, I think. So I think what's missing from this video that's also probably eking us quite a bit is community, friendships, and family. So he has his dogs, but he's a 28-year-old and doesn't have... Clearly, you mentioned that he's got a wedding ring, so probably married, but there's no kids running around. There's not that sense. He's not meeting up with friends, going out to lunch, meeting after work, working out with a gym buddy, any of those things. He's not with his main extended family doing all those things. You talk about family, family farms, agriculture, every, they had a lot of kids because they needed helping hands on the farm, but everyone was close. Everyone was working together. This video to me just felt so isolated. And again, it was this, it was that scene from fight club where it's the lone narrator who just is, ends up making a friend him, out of himself because he has nothing. And that's kind of what the feeling I got from that. And that's really what scares me too. Yeah, no, it, it definitely does. And I, I think this is such a, a, a trap that creators on social media fall into, right? You know, that they're, they're trying to portray what they want to portray. Right. And, um, you know, somebody is like, 
say somebody makes woodworking videos, right? And they're like, oh, you don't do that right. And, and so it's, it's, it just really affects them mentally too. And, you know, I, I think just really, you know, looking at the guy's posts, you know, he, he posts basically the same thing, you know, occasionally he'll post, um, you know, different things. Um, but it's, it's pretty much the whole, you know, nine to five thing. That's, that's his shtick. Right. But I've also seen where like doctors do the same exact thing, but we don't see that controversy for it because it is such a, a more exciting field and, and they're doing something different. And, and I think there's just, you know, such a difference that people put on creators where they're like, you have to have such, you know, as great a life as this person. Right. And it, it's just such a bad, you know, rap that creators get. And it's not the creator's fault. It's the audience's fault is we kind of like Wyatt mentioned, we're projecting what we want out of life onto these creators. And, 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 and I think that's kind of where, you know, this guy is at is he wants to project his life, good, bad, or indifferent. He could be depressed. He could be the happiest guy in the world, but it's, it's that projecting that we're doing because of the type of work that he's, he's putting out there, the, the whole cubicle, the nine to five and people hate that. Right. So I, I think it's just such a unique, you know, viewpoint of, you know, him doing that versus a doctor, you know, waking up at four and showing their life and going into surgeries and stuff like that. It's a much more exciting video and why it kind of hit him on the head. It was very sad music. It, it, it makes it for a very sad video. And I think if it had, you know, um, a happier music, um, like yeah, the Benny be Hill theme, that'd be amazing. Yeah. I, I think it would be completely different. different. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, and it's, and I think that we're just, we're pulling what from it, what we want out of it a hundred percent because it is such a mundane video. If it was a much more exciting video, like I couldn't relate to a doctor kind of thing. So I, I can't, I'm, I'm just going to enjoy it for what it is. I can relate to this. You guys can relate to this video, it, but we're also pulling what we want out of it for sure. And it's such a trap of social media is, is that's, that's what any audience does for their people that they watch. Well, it's a, it pulls me to art, right? Because you can get so much out of a piece of art that and see something that someone else can't see. So maybe TikTok is art. Maybe there'll be fine art TikTok people. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> sure. <Yeah. laughs> well, gentlemen, we're getting close to the end of our time here. So let's go around the horn and final thoughts. Um, Ryan, you're a guest. You go ahead and start first. Uh, what, you know, we'll of course sign off, but what, just to reiterate, thank you for coming on it and, and yeah. kind of debating this video with us, but what are your final thoughts on this? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, again, thanks for, for having me. I know I've been bugging why I like, Hey, I'm, I'm always available. Just let me know. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's something where I, I, I find it so fascinating. Just the, the mental processes that people go through when, when watching videos, right? Like I, I was binge watching, um, videos of people making food and, like just eating it really quick, right? It, you know, they were making noodles and, and sausages and they were just eating it. Um, but looking at the comments, you know, people are like, oh, I don't know why they eat so quick or I don't know why to do this. And it's just, it's like me, I was enjoying it. I was like, oh, this is this is cool. It's, it's mind numbing and this is great because I just want to kind of take a mental break kind of thing. So I, you know, I, I think it's such a unique, you know, video because it did create such, such a controversy for people, people really enjoyed it. They're like, wow, thank you for letting me, you know, take a look into your life. And other people was like, wow, man, your life sucks. You're depressed, but hey, <laughs> you got a cute dog. So you have that going for you, right? And it, it's just, I, I love seeing debates like this because it, it's, I'm, I'm always fascinated with what goes on in people's brains and how they process things. It goes back to me wanting to be a psychologist when I was in, in high school. And I very much still love that part of, you know, the human psyche. And it, it's just such an interesting, you know, thing to, to kind of talk about and, and look at because it's just so funny to see what other people think for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's irregardless of what the guy's actual life is, his happiness, what his intent of the video, it definitely just tapped into something. And for me, it just tapped into the scariness of the potential of today's modern life <laughs> and the trappings and the allure of it. And that was something that was interesting because it's some in the comments you look, it's some people are aspire to this type of life. Some people are completely content with this type of life and some people are terrified of this type of life. 
And I guess I'm of that camp where I am somewhat terrified of it. Not because I don't want to have a cute dog that I love because I do have that or a nice house that I own or any of those things or a stable job with benefits. But just how going through the motions of every day, what the actual work looks like, what your life looks like, that's not the type of life ultimately that I would want to aspire to live. And but it is a life that you feel like you're starting to fall into or you could be easily trapped into. And I think that was my initial reaction to why I was like, oh, no. And then post it in the memes to try to get some uh, reactions from you guys. <laughs> yeah. I think, Tanner, I think I think the way you described this video is probably perfect. It's a litmus test. It's a litmus test because you'll find people like Ryan or you'll find people like me or you'll find people like you. All three of us have different perspectives on this video. Tanner, you're terrified of it. Ryan's like, the dude's life is just fine. And me, I'm like, boo, boo, <laughs> wear tie dye and make gardens. Um, at the end of the day, it is a fantastic litmus test. And I think what people are starting to wake up to and realize is that it's okay to want something else in life. I think it's okay to move over and to bring it full circle back to the entrepreneurship and, and to the startings of business. Lots and lots and lots of people start businesses in their late thirties, forties, and fifties because they wake up and they think, gosh, I'm in the cycle and this cycle is not what I wanted out of my life. And you have to make a decision someday. Are you going to continue to sit in that gray cubicle eating your 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 frozen flatbread um, at night? Or are you going to change? And And it's not bad either way. I'm not saying people who stay at a company for 40 some odd years collect retirement and, and move on are, are, are less than in any way, shape or form. That's not at all what I'm trying to project. In fact, I'm jealous of the people who have that, have that kind of stick to itness, I guess. Um, because my ADHD brain just wants to chase butterflies. Um, so it's important for people to evaluate where they are, to evaluate where they could be and different alternatives. And, but, but be careful of that grass is greener, you know, perspective, because I've made big moves in my life and physical moves that I immediately regretted. I have made change jobs or taken promotions that I have immediately regretted um, because I thought the grass would be greener. Um, it, you just got to evaluate what you want out of life. And I think it's okay to change at any time, whether you're st fresh in your career or you're 60 and you retire in four years. It's okay to change things up and do whatever you want. It's your life. You only got one of them. Do whatever the hell you want, right? That's what I get out of it. Perfect. All right. Well, with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody who made it all the way through three guys over analyzing a TikTok for an hour. <laughs> um, make, make sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. And we promise we will we'll have more guests on and we'll bring Ryan back too, especially whenever we hit some more long walls of text with each other. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. All right, perfect. Well, we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.